Hey, everybody, and welcome to uh, AQ's Blog and Grill. We're really happy today to have um, Donna Litt with us. Donna is the co-founder and chief operating officer of uh, Uvaro, uh, based here in uh, Waterloo, Ontario, which is kind of the, uh, the tech capital, if you will, of, uh, I think, of North America. The heck with those, uh, you know, Silicon Valley guys. What, what do they know? So, um, Donna, please... Uh, welcome and and thank you very much for being here today. And uh, can you tell us a little bit about Uvaro? What is it that you guys are doing? Yeah, thank you so much for having me join. It's an absolute honor and pleasure. And what we do at Uvaro is help professionals have more fulfilling careers. So sounds super lofty, but uh, in in practice, what that means is we provide reskilling uh, as well as career development products. Wow, great and. This is, uh, how long has Uvaro been an entity? <laughs> That's a great question. We've been an entity since 2017 okay. uh, as an organization, but we've been through many iterations of our product and, and what our business is doing. And so we didn't launch Uvaro in, in its current state until January of 2020. So most people will think of it as, as being a, a 2020 baby, so to speak. <laughs> okay, but these, these things always get started before they yeah. become obvious, aren't they? So, and you've had an interesting career as a, uh, as an entrepreneur. I mean, there, you, you go back into Tribe HR um, and then from, and then Tribe HR was purchased or acquired by, was it that sweet? That's right. Wow. Okay. And then you went from, uh, from there into uh, another interesting um, startup, which was called Kite, K-I-I-T-E. And now, um, now has, was the, have you pivoted out of Kite or does Kite still exist and operate and, and is it anywhere separate from Uvaro? Yes, yes. Excellent question. So Kite was founded in 2017. That was our original entity. And through all of the learning that we gained by bringing that, what was a technology product to market, servicing sales professionals, we ultimately learned what their, what their fundamental needs were, what the market needed. And that's what led to Uvaro in 2020. So uh, Uvaro's inception, or really the origins of Uvaro are Kite. Wow. Okay, now that's very interesting because people think that, that a startup has this you know, burst of, of brilliance and everything gets started and oh, then the money starts to pour in, uh, you know, from sales and whatever. But you've actually had this uh, progression, uh, I think even starting with Tribe HR, into um, this, this field. So is that, do you see that much in the startup community? Uh, I, I love that question because it really is, experience really is a series of layers and no matter how you look at it, it's always going to be cumulative. And so absolutely the platform that Tribe HR provided us helped, helped get us to where we are today, Kite as well. So I think, you know, at a, at a high level, putting my thinking cap on, absolutely you see that with every entrepreneur because your life's experiences just yeah. accumulate and point you in new directions. I think with the Uvaro experience specifically, and with Tribe HR, there's a bit of a unique uh, product story here mm -hmm. because we went to market with a sales enablement technology and we just, you know, nose to the ground, chased, chased what the data was telling us and what the customer's needs were. And it brought us to career success, which is interesting, quite a leap. However, when I think about Tribe HR, our origin story there and the reason that we were doing what we were doing was really to help bring career success to professionals. And so it ended up being a full, you know, 360 and Tribe HR was founded in 2011, URO 2020. So 10 years later, it's this journey that's culminated in, uh, in what is a brand new service offering. So very much layers to answer your question. Yeah, thank you. And, and knowing, knowing you and, and uh, one of your co-founders, Joseph, um, you're not going to stop here. I mean, this is, you're, you're experiencing some great success now with Uvaro and, and whatever, but I have a sense that there's, you know, yet more of the journey to unfold. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I hope so. <laughs> I hope so. I was, I was speaking with our, our co-op actually recently. She was saying, you know, I, I hear that in, in your thirties, um, you know, things change and, and you just become a little bit more close-minded and, and I'm paraphrasing. She didn't say those exact words, but that was the topic of conversation. And I assured her that while that may be true, there are things that you gain in addition to getting older. And so I do think as we continue down this path, this is every day is a new beginning 
and uh, absolutely things build and and i would i hear your your uh thoughts and i would agree with them <laughs> okay great now tell me a little bit about your co-founders because you've been in these these organizations and you've you've helped build but it's it's and it's been with it's not but and it's been with uh some co-founders so how's that worked out for you yeah, so I have the distinct pleasure of knowing my co-founders for one, on one hand, my whole life, which is Joseph, he's my, my big brother, uh, as well as Derek, who I've known for the majority of my life because he and Joseph go far back as well. And really, truly the benefit of working so closely with people is that you develop these, you develop a level of trust uh, and communication that you just, you don't get uh, in, in your standard professional relationships. And so that's uh -huh. absolutely translated what it's also done is helped ensure that we're very aligned. So okay. from day one uh, with the organization, there were some aspects that we were incredibly well aligned on and those were gained from having worked together previously and we've just strengthened and built, built those since. So there's, there's significant gains um, from that end. And on the flip side, it lets us you know, tease and, and know that we're not hurting anyone's feelings uh, because that trust is there as well. Very good. So, um, what's it like when you when you get together for like a holiday dinner or a social <laughs> event? You've got, you know, there's the whole parental thing, there's the family thing, and then is it still business relationships, or is that all pushed aside? Yeah, you know, we are a family of entrepreneurs. Truly, yes. my my father moved here from Hong Kong when he was in his early twenties, and you know, one of the first things he did was set up his own shop and, and business, and my mother's the same way. She's she's very entrepreneurial. Has founded multiple businesses. Has you know been been in that space. So ever since we were little, the topic of dinner conversation has been, you know, "What are you building today?" And yeah. so there's no change. Yeah, good. Well, I did a little bit of groundwork. I knew you were going to answer somewhat around that <laughs> uh, in that area because of your parents, uh, you know, distinction of of you know starting and and building, and then. Um, you know, you and Joseph, I think Joseph kind of follows you around. I, I think, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, well, he described it very well today. Cause I said, my job is to keep the wheels on the bus. And he said, well, I guess my job is to try to break the bus. <laughs> and I laughed cause that's true. <laughs> yeah. So you, you have the role of uh, chief operating officer. So uh, what does that mean in terms of mm. the, the current uh, corporate structure? Yeah, yeah, that is a really good question. Um, so I think that that analogy, wheels on the bus, is a really is a significant one. But as we mature and, and use use this round of funding to grow, it's it's much more about keeping the wheels on the bus. It's making sure there's oil in the engine, yep. that you know the twists and turns up ahead are anticipated, that everybody's buckled in and their expectations are managed, and they they know when to get off, when to get on. <laughs> All those aspects factor yeah. in, and and ultimately, as you know operations, uh, head of operations, my job is to be the best possible tour guide there ever could be, tour operator. Um, yeah. and, he, and, and that's kind of how we, how we look at it. Um, and I know that, you know, it's a bit of a, an interesting metaphor, but uh, hopefully captures the essence. Yeah, absolutely. So um, here you are now as your, your head of operations and chief uh, operating officer. Where does archaeology fit into this? Because you went to, I believe it was the University of Toronto, and one of your majors was archaeology. So, <laughs> you know, I love university in terms of it's a great place to learn how to learn. Um, it, what is it that got you from digging up dead bodies into, oh, I, I mean, artifacts, and to uh, creating uh, artifacts that could be used in the, the whole sales process? Yeah, yeah, that is, um, that is an excellent question. And, you know, the thing about archaeology is that you are a storyteller, but you're doing that with data. And you're often doing that with people who no longer have the ability to tell their own stories. Right. In most cases, their ancestors are no longer, you know, walking this planet, they can't, there's no continu continuity, or in the most important circumstances, there is continuity. And so, uh, really with archaeology, it's about identity representation, it's about truth saying, it's about ensuring that you're actually interpreting the data in as respectful and, and clear a way as possible. Mm -hmm. And when you think about technology and technology companies, you know, our world is around reading the data and doing so in a way that authentically represents our customer journeys. Mm -hmm. And so there's a very, there's a very clear skills uh, overlap in terms of just understanding how to storytell from disparate data sets. Um, absolutely. But then I think what's 
what's been more powerful or helpful for me coming from a humanities background is really that understanding of why because with traditional STEM, you get a lot of how and what, yeah. but it's yeah. disconnected from the why. And without the why, there's no point. And, uh, and so bringing that perspective, which is rife within archaeology, that's really what it's all about, is the why of things, uh, to this space has really been, I mean, helpful for me and, and necessity, because I couldn't have done it any other way. Okay. Well, that, that's a great answer. And I, that's, really, um, that's really revealing in terms of, you know, putting... Uh, really into practice uh, what may have been seen 15 years ago as why the heck is Donna doing that? Uh, <laughs> I get that know, question to this day. <laughs> you, you, just, you just answered it. Uh, you just answered it beautifully. Um, yeah. And I'm, I'm, a, I'm okay with STEM, but I'm a bigger fan of steam. I think, you know, the arts have got to be put into, or we will lose that humanity. We, you know, we'll lose the intuition and the insight and the um, knowledge, the wisdom, if you will, by just focusing on STEM. So yeah. you and I, we're going to change the world. We're going to make STEAM really go. Okay, so this raise that we, we've talked about, you've had an interesting uh, history, uh, even recent, of, you know, starting with angel investment and, and whatever, and then doing a, a, a raise such as the one that was just uh, announced recently of $12 million. Uh, what, what is that raise going to be used for? What are you guys going to uh, leverage that uh, towards? Yeah, yeah, that's an excellent question. So um, absolutely bringing new kind of recurring and uh, reskilling and recurring products okay. to market. Yeah, so we'll be looking to kind of grow our product base. Um, but ultimately also apply all the learnings that we've had on how to make our existing customer base successful, apply those learnings. Uh, and then as we continue to drive new enrollments and, and new growth, take those new products and, and, and make them available to our membership. So absolutely, it's, it's fueling growth. Uh, really, we're, we're on a mission to help as many career professionals as possible find success in their mission and, and what they've chosen to do. Uh, to be able to, to drive their own career ambitions forward. And so that's exactly what the funding is going to be moving toward and or being dedicated to rather. And uh, through, that's going to be done through product growth, uh, new products added, and then expanding into our existing base. Wow. Uh, that's an exciting prospect. And, and uh, I know you guys are going to convert uh, those dollars and cents into value. I mean, I'm afraid that a lot of startup founders uh, look at a raise and go, hey, look, at, we've got some money. And yeah, you do, but you also have responsibilities to convert that into uh, value. And oh, yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. So, you know, you really, you're, you and Joseph and your other co founder are heading into this, I think, with exactly the right attitude. Now, one thing that, Donna, you're famous for uh, with, uh, with your co founders is in these organizations you founded is great culture. Um, I've always heard, fabulous things. I've chatted to people who have worked with you and um, your team, your leadership team comes off very, very well uh, in terms of how you handle culture and how you, um, you know, can keep that up in very much a roller coaster economy. I don't know when the economy is ever not going to be a roller coaster, but right now. So what is it that, that you folks are doing that makes the culture at Uvaro and, and um, Kite and, and Tribe HR? What's the special ingredient? Yeah, that, I mean, that's a wonderful question. It's wonderful to hear that's the case. Uh, truthfully, I think it's it's expectation management. So you'll often hear transparency and, and that's mm. kind of like, you know, sometimes being honest is, is an excuse to be a jerk. Um, expectation management is, and, uh, and uh, transparency can kind of be thought of in that same way. It's not enough to be transparent. You have to manage expectations. And, and I think that starts first and foremost with leadership's expectations. Mm -hmm. there's, there's this inclination in the startup space to grow quickly, quickly, quickly and sacrifice certain uh, growth strategies like mm -hmm. writing a job description, for example, uh, because you wanna grow fast and you don't know what the role is. And so you, you don't really write a description. And that's, that's great because you move quickly. But what that does is it sets everybody up for, for failure because there's no clear expectations. And mm -hmm. when you're a high risk startup, there's this inclination to hire people who have a high degree of ownership and who have a risk threshold that's very high. Yes. But the reality is no one's gonna have 
more ownership than the founders and no one's going to have a higher risk threshold than the founders. And so pushing that down onto your teammates is one, in, inappropriate and two, also a recipe for failure. And so what we've always done is really try to manage expectations, um, which really starts with hiring. It's what is the job description? What are the skills? What are the competencies? What are we actually reasonably asking for people from people? Okay. And if we as an organization can't deliver on our commitments, uh, what, is the, what is the end result? And having that conversation up front. Similarly, if they're not able to deliver on their commitments, what will the, the end result be? And so being able to articulate those early, early, early and set those expectations just changes how you do everything else. Yeah. Well, I know you have a very loyal, even people that have left your organization for one reason or another, refer back to um, those three organizations as being darn good experiences. So uh, congratulations on that. And it's, That's great. you know, it, it's a conscious effort. I mean, it's not just, oh, well, you know, we do the, No, it, it, it means a lot to get that kind of um, feeling, um, you know, which feelings are important. And, uh, it, you know, it's not about, I know, you know, 10, 15 years ago, it was all kind of a bro culture where, you know, well, you had to burn, you had to, you know, you had to burn 18 hours a day, six days a week in order to feel that you were contributing or that's what was expected of you. But it, as you say, well, let's get this straight. You know, there are things we need you to do and you're responsible for and we'll be responsible for this and that. So I think that's a really enlightened uh, way to go about it. Now, what's going to happen with the uh, organization, you get started and then the pandemic arrives. Um, so mostly you go to a remote um, you know, solution. Uh, you're probably still in that. And what are you gonna do you know, once this opens up a little bit more in office space? What, what's, what have you got in mind? Yeah, yeah, really great questions and very top of mind for many operators who I'm speaking with mm -hmm. currently. We've, we, had, we were always remote friendly. And so when we moved remote first as a business, the transition was a gentle one because that was the case. We had systems in place, et cetera, to be able, that we could lean into. Uh, that, was, that was advantageous, but the reality is as a result of now being remote only, and, and we'll continue to be remote uh, only that just for the foreseeable future, there's no plan mm -hmm. to return to a standard office. Uh, it's really forced us to document, lean into documentation, lean into our processes and procedures. We were already inclined to be a process-driven organization. And so it's really forced us to, to, to flex those muscles in a big way to be able to support it. And, and that allows us to create, again, a workplace where people can, can engage autonomously, but then also you know, not just get the answers to their questions, but engage in ways that is appropriate because it's been, been the, the boundaries have been set, so to speak. Yeah. Um, but as, I, as we move forward and we think about office space, it's not about an HQ that everybody can come to because the reality is we've hired people globally and yeah. there will always be meetings where some people can come physically and some can't, which means there will yeah. always be disadvantaged individuals. Right. And so in order to help uh, mitigate against those scenarios, office space for us becomes a tool and something that we think about in terms of where do we have concentrations of individuals who we can benefit with this tool and what are the ways of using this tool? What is it going to provide for us? So is it a space for client meetings, customer meetings, et cetera? And then what are the rules of engagement? So yes. satellite locations for those types of activities, but never a central office. Yeah. Yeah, boy, that's, uh, that's well thought out. And, and um, likely you're gonna end up doing something very close to that and then adjusting as you, as you go forward. So just before we wrap up, uh, Don, I want to ask about this uh, impact scholarship uh, thing. The, what are you folks doing? And I, th I think it's a great uh, endeavor on your part. But could you explain a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So uh, what we've done is set up a, an impact scholarship for 10 women every year. Uh, it's five women, five women of color who they self-identify as uh, to be able to take our program at no cost. So it covers the, the program fees, uh, which are 6,000 US. So it covers that uh, entirely. And so they, they're able to take the program, get full access to the, the learning, the career development, et cetera. And uh, that's been sponsored by local organizations 
to be able to cover those costs. And, and right. as a result, we're able to, to open that up. Well, that's that's wonderful. And I think that's another extension, if you will, of your, you know, your bias to culture and, and your bias to humanity in terms of let's see if we can help. You know, always look for the helpers is, has been a thing that uh, I learned over the years is mm. if you find a helper, you're finding a, a person who's already on their, you know, their journey to be, you know, to goodness. Um, and, you know, goodness is better than badness. <laughs> Goodness is better than badness. There you go. I, I, I appreciate that scale and I, I would agree with it. <laughs> okay. So we talked a little bit about, you know, balancing, balancing career and, you know, not getting, oh, don't get burned out and whatever. So I, I just got to ask you uh, um, about this. <laughs> wow. I mean, you wrote, wow. <laughs> you, I, you wrote this a couple of years ago and I, I, this is my copy. I bought it a couple of years ago. And this is a serious uh, effort by uh, DM Litt, uh, Donald Litt here. And, and why did you have to do this? Because I thought, I, I got the fish feeling that you were compelled to tell this story, which is kind of about uh, time shifting and all that, you know, this is, this is one deep piece of literature here. This is not a beach book and it's, it's well done. So, but why? Yeah, um, great question. Why? Uh, I think I had the opportunity to, and and it's less about why and more about why not. I think uh, is is true truly it. Uh, I had the opportunity. It was one of those circumstances where you cannot count on an opportunity like that again to take right. the time, yeah. and so wanted to take advantage of it because I could, and and why not? I I was interested and wanted to see where it could go. Excellent. Why not? Wow. Well, uh, congratulations. Do you, do you have a, a, a sequel in mind? I mean, <laughs> thank you. Uh, one trick pony. No, you know what? I, I love, I love writing and that's always yeah. going to be a part of me. And, and, you know, I spoke about my entrepreneurial mother. I also have a, a writer mother and uh -huh. uh, she's, she's very much shaped, shaped me and, and our family uh -huh. in these ways. And so uh, always writing whether it's going to be definitely not going to crowdfund the publication of it again <laughs> that was a big learning for me but uh, certainly look forward to, to future future days where I can invest more time into that wonderful well we'll we'll wait anxiously uh, <laughs> for that moment um, so I, I mean I, I'm I'm a literature guy and and you know the depth that some of this uh, these insights go into for these you know because this is not an easy subject um, to get into because, again, it's a little bit about expectations and, and asking why not. The, the main characters, there wouldn't be a story if they had not said, okay, what, well, you know, why not? Let's do this. And, wow. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you. Wow. I haven't seen that in a while. So I appreciate <laughs> it. I, I wasn't expecting that. Thank you. Well, that, you know, I like to throw a little surprise in there. Yes. Every it worked. Time. So in your experience, uh, Donna, any quick advice uh, for organizations that are, you know, coming, I, I would consider now you've already be a stay up, you're not a startup, you're, <laughs> you know, every, every day you might feel like a startup and that's great, but um, what, if you had to share three things with, with people that are coming along, uh, what are the things that, that have helped you? Yeah, I think first and foremost, remembering that you only ever have 24 hours in a day to count on. Um, most importantly, I think making sure that as important as it is to figure out what you have to be good at, it's equally important to determine what you have to be good at being bad at. Right. Um, or else you never prioritize and, and you get yeah. sucked into the black hole. <laughs> and then, yeah, exactly. Uh, and then I think the third thing, it's interesting, three things. I think, I mean, the third thing is if you're looking to grow your team, invest in good hiring practices, yeah. period. That's yeah. it. Yeah. Technology is great and it's, it's our product or our platform, but oh boy, it, it is about the people that, that help us get there and, and take ownership and become really um, not just advocates, but evangelists. Um, for the organization. And I think what you guys are going to do is the people that you're helping, you know, through your course and through your training and learning, they will become your sales force. They will become your, um, 
ambassadors uh, to the rest of the world. And wow, what a great platform to have that go on. Donna, it's been a real pleasure um, having this chat with you. I hope you enjoyed it. You sh your sharing was wonderful. Um, say hello to Joseph. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, he seems like a good kid. You know, good, good hire on your part. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I'll make sure that I write a LinkedIn recommendation for him. Yeah, <laughs> for his congratulate, next role. congratulate your parents. They seem to have done a pretty good entrepreneurial recruitment uh, program in the Fung thank household. You. Okay, Donna, thank you, and uh, thank you. we'll be on uh, on the air very soon. Thank you Bye so for much. Now, I Jess it. Great. Take care. Bye. <laughs>